praise God. Well, family, as you know, we've been on a journey for the last couple of weeks doing a series called The Holy Bible. Hasn't it been a great series? We've had a wonderful time, and, and obviously uh, this is part number three of that series. And tonight's message is subtitled, Why the Bible Can Be Trusted. Can you trust this book? Is it just stories? Or is it real? And we're going to find out why we can trust the Bible. That's what we're going to look at this evening. Why it can be trusted. And you will see that it is real, it is true, and you can trust this book. In week one, we saw uh, the passion behind the Bible. I believe teacher Paul did week one. He did a great job. Amen. It was awesome. And then last week, we saw what the Bible was all about. Pastor Jenny brought us that message. We found out what that is about. And we've also learned that in this series, that the Bible simply means book. The word Bible simply means book. But it's not just any book. It's a holy book. A holy book. And the word holy really means set apart. Something that's special to you and I. Anything that's holy is set apart and is special. And anything that's important to you or to me in our lives, whatever that thing is, we always make sure that we give it extra attention, don't we? It has special care. Anything that you place value on, you don't just throw in a corner or ignore. It has a special place. If your family members have left you some sort of an heirloom, and it was something important to the family, you would always have a special place for it, wouldn't you? And so the Bible is special to us, family, and we need to treat it that way. We need to set it apart as holy. We need to treat it as special and make sure it has priority in our lives because it is a holy book. And as we went through this uh, teaching of the last two weeks, there was a memory verse that we had to remember, Right? I'm not going to get you to do any homework, so relax. But we had memory verses, and so uh, there was one for the first week, one for the second week. And we have another one for tonight, so I'm going to ask you to look at the screen, Matthew 24, 35. Let's read it out together. Are you ready? Matthew 24, 35 says this, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. That is so true. The Word of God will never, ever pass away. You know, family, no matter what man tries to do to destroy it, to delete it, to trample on it, Jesus just told us now in Matthew, my words will never pass away. And that is the truth. And so tonight, I want to give you seven convincing proofs that the Bible can be trusted and relied upon. Seven. Are you ready for them? Seven convincing truths. I believe you can follow in the church app if you'd like to do that as well. You can go through there and add extra notes. But I want to encourage you to write them down. If you have a notebook, if you write them down, I believe you'll remember them and they'll really be deposited more in your heart. So let's start off with number one. This is not in any order of preference, but the first one I have here, number one, the one of the convincing proofs that the Bible can be trusted and relied upon is this. The Holy Bible is historically accurate. It's historically accurate. You see, a lot of people know that the Bible has good principles, right? It has good principles. But sadly, there are some, and it really hurts me to say this, but even some pastors, I've heard even some pastors say that the principles are right, but some of the stories are just made up. The principles are right, but some of the stories are just made up. It hurts me to say that, but sometimes people think that it's just some stories. And the reason why some believers or pastors say that is because they have an issue with their own faith. They have an issue with their own faith. They are saying that there are some things that are just humanly impossible. And because it's humanly impossible... And they have an issue with their faith. They say, well, it's just a story to illustrate a principle. But that's not the case at all. You see, for them to be able to say, well, it's not humanly possible for a man to live in the belly of a whale for three days. It's not humanly possible for that to happen. Well, I would respond to them and say to them, I agree with you. It's not humanly possible for a man to live in the belly of a whale for three days. Neither is it possible for a virgin birth, and neither is it humanly possible for a resurrection. 
But family, there's a lot of things that are not humanly possible. But we as a church have chosen to put our faith in those words and believe that the God who can turn impossible situations around can make those things that seem humanly possible, possible. How many people in this room or online have faced a life-challenging situation where the doctors gave up hope and you're alive today? Humanly impossible, but you're alive today because you put your faith in the living word of God. You see, family, Psalm 33 verse 4 says this, For the word of the Lord is not only true, but it is right. The word of the Lord is right and true. It's both right and true. You see, it's not made up. This book is not made up. So how can you prove if something is historically accurate? How can you prove that? Well, there is an historically accurate standard that exists out there. It's not a Christian standard. Because if it was just a Christian standard, then you could say, well, okay, you guys made the standard. So obviously that'll prove your word. But it's a standard that's used by historians to prove things. And they have three steps, three things that need to happen in order for something to be proved historically accurate. They have these standards. So the first one, they say, in order for something to be proved that it's historically accurate, you have to have an eyewitness account. The first thing is there has to be somebody who saw it. Eyewitness account. Okay, somebody was there. It's not I heard from my uncle's aunt who knows a friend who lives overseas who heard from their cousin. No, somebody had to be there. There had to be an eyewitness account. And we know that the Bible was written by people who saw it. Think of the Gospels. The Gospels were written by men who walked with Jesus. They lived with Jesus. And when they penned the Gospels, they didn't lean over and, 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 and uh, um, Luke was looking to, said to Matthew, hey, Matthew, what are you writing in chapter 1, verse 7? It wasn't like that. They didn't, they didn't uh, compare notes. They wrote what they, what, what they were eyewitness to. So yeah, there had to be people that were present. And so we know that these men were present and the writers of the Bible were present. Most of the people who wrote the word of God were eyewitnesses to what took place. The second standard that they have which these historians have, is they say that when you have record keeping, when you write records, it has to be recorded and copied with extreme care. With extreme care. There, there can't just be a casual writing. There has to be an order of how things are done. And family, I believe the reason God chose the Jewish people and gave them the responsibility of giving us the written word of God is because they are known historically to be the most uh, particular scribes in the world. Did you know that? They are known to be the most particular scribes in the world. In fact, when the Jewish scribes would have recorded the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, when they recorded that, they didn't translate it word for word. They translated it letter for letter. That's what they did. And when they had finished writing the Torah, they could go right to the middle, to the middle letter, and what they would do is they would then calculate both ways and count it. And if it didn't match up, if it didn't calculate, they threw the whole thing away and started again. That's how particular these scribes were when they did that. They went to the Torah and they, they, they did that calculation. They knew exactly where they were. They knew exactly the middle letter and they calculated that. They had the most meticulous standards for the original text. And there is this myth that is going around or has been going around, that every time the word of God is translated, it gets weaker and weaker and it loses its original writings. That's what the myth is. But this is the truth. You might know this. In 1948 and beyond, they found what we know as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Have you heard of that? The Dead Sea Scrolls are known to be some of the oldest manuscripts of Scripture out there, the oldest so they came back as far back as they have found any writings. And what they did was when they compared our modern day Bible against those manuscripts, which are the oldest recorded in history, it all lined up. It all lined up. 
So we can see that the word of God is copied with complete accuracy and care. It has not lost its original intent and purpose. The third thing that these historians look for is there has to be an, um, where's my place here? One second. Archaeological confirmation. Archaeological confirmation. In other words, they have to find stuff that relates back to what the Bible says. They have to find stuff that relates back to a nation or an empire or a people. That's what they have to do. And so the, when these archaeologists, archaeologists do their work, they found archaeology. Let me go again. We got it. Archaeological digs to discover that these people actually existed. They found the digs to prove these people existed. But there was one exception. There was one exception that they didn't find for 1900 years, which the Bible spoke about. And they thought, well, okay, maybe the Bible missed it with this particular nation. But in the early 1900s, during a dig, they found stuff that belonged to the Hittite nation, which covered every single person, empire, a nation that the Bible referred to, they found stuff relating to these people, then confirming that those three things line up to say the Bible is historically accurate. That's what they found. Isn't that amazing? So family, the Bible is not only good and true, but it is right. It is right. The second point to prove that the Bible is true and can, can be relied on is this, that the Holy Bible is scientifically accurate. It's scientifically accurate. We all know that science changes. <laughs> In the last two years, we've heard a lot about science changing. <laughs> oh, we thought it worked this way, but now the science changed. Science does change, though. Science has changed in your lifetime. If I go back to my science books that I studied at school, which for some of you is you weren't even alive when I was at school. If you go back to use that science, it's not going to work. Because science has changed. How many of you studied computer science in the last 30 years? Those books are obsolete. They don't even work anymore. We don't even refer to them. Science is changing. It evolves. But the truth stays the same. You see, family, God knows all truth. So there are no scientific inaccuracies in his word. If you read Psalm 148 from verse 5, it says this, the New Living Translation. It says, let every created thing give praise to the Lord. For he issued his command and they came into being. He established them forever and ever. His orders will never be revoked. Never be revoked. So for a book that was written over a period of 1,600 years. We learned that last week. This book was written over a period of 1,600 years. You would think there should be one scientific thing that needs to be corrected. That's what you would think, right? At least one. But the truth is there's not. There's not a single thing. In fact, if you go to the Louth, the Louth in Paris, there is a vault there. Listen to this. A vault that has five and a half kilometers long of scientific books. If you laid them out, five and a half kilometers long of scientific books that were written in the past that are now outdated. They're outdated. That science is just all wrong. We don't even follow it anymore. One of them, listen to this, one of those books was written in 1861 by the French Academy of Science. The French Academy of Science, and this is what its title was. 51 incontrovertible scientific facts that prove the Bible is wrong. 51 incontrovertible scientific facts that prove the Bible is wrong. Listen to this. And since then, all 51 have been controverted, refuted, and disproved. All 51. It proves that they were wrong, and the Bible is right. You see, family, there was also science wisdom of the day. Going back in our history, there was science wisdom of the day and what people thought and what they believed was the right things to do. One of them 
that people believed the wisdom and science of the day was that the earth was flat. And explorers thought you could sail off the edge of the earth. Some still do believe it's flat. That's very sad. But anyway, it was believed that for over 2,000 years that the earth was flat. But all they had to do was go 2,600 years before that and read Isaiah 40 verse 22, which says, God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. Circle. That word circle is the Hebrew word sphere. It's where we get our word globe from. You know a globe? That's where we get that word from. Now, God's surely not confused. He knows the difference between a circle and something that's flat, right? So that's what the Bible, they just had to read that. That's all they had to do is go to the Bible. It would have told them. Let me give you another one. It was believed, this was believed for almost for, forever that the numbers of stars could actually be counted. The stars outside could actually be counted. And Hipparchus in 150 BC counted the stars and he counted 1,022. Count 1,022. Then 300 years later, 150 AD, Ptolemy recounted them. And he said, no, no, Hipparchus was wrong. He missed four. There were 1,026. That's what he said. But if you do a research today, they say that according to modern day information, there are way over 200 billion trillion stars. 200 billion trillion, more than that. Again, if they just went to Jeremiah 33, 22, it says the stars of the sky cannot be counted. There are galaxies upon galaxies that we haven't even found yet. So how they're counting them, I don't know. It's impossible. That's our creator. He has another one. Would you like to hear another one? All the medical people. Science believed, listen to this. And that's not so long ago. Science believed that too much blood made you sick. Too much blood in your system made you sick. And they used a medical practice called humorism, humoralism, sorry. And they believed that sickness came from four body fluids that you had to get out of your system. It was yellow bell, black bell, phlegm, and blood. And if you get them out of your system, it'll help you not being sick. And they had a practice called bloodletting, bloodletting. And when you were sick, they would cut you so the blood could flow out because they believed that you'd, that would heal you. And here's the thing is that the American president, George Washington, ever heard of him? Well, he actually died from bloodletting because they did it to him four times and he bled out and he died. And that was only 200 years ago. Only 200 years ago, not thousands of years ago. And they believed that just 200 years ago. But what did Leviticus 17.11 say? Leviticus, Leviticus 17.11 says, For the life of the body is in the blood. And today we try to get blood into you. We do blood transfusions to get blood into you. There's life in the blood. But that's what science believed back then. Another area where they got it wrong completely was in the Middle Ages. And in the Middle Ages, there was a plague that hit Europe. 25% of Europe died from the bubonic plague. I'm sure you all heard of that, 25%. You see, back then, they didn't understand about how things could be contagious and that you should actually separate people and isolate people and possibly even wear a mask. Thank the Lord we're not marrying them. But they didn't know that. I mean, you know, if you really got flu, the bad flu, you know you stay away from people. You understand that, right? Because you can transmit it. But they didn't know that. And 25% of Europe died because of that. But if they just read Leviticus 13 verse 4, it says here, the priest will quarantine a person for seven days. Even the Bible would teach them to separate people when they're overcoming. If they just read the word of God, all in there. You see, family, it's all in God's word. Why? Because Psalm 12 verse 6 says this, and the words of the Lord are flawless. The words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. Are you learning something, church? 
Well, here's the third one. A third reason to help you prove that the Bible can be trusted is the Bible is prophetically accurate. Prophetically accurate. You see, it's one thing, and uh, this one is an interesting thing. This, this particular one is very interesting. Let me tell you why. It's very risky because you're not just asking people to believe in a book that you're writing and think, well, will you believe in what I'm writing? But when you start making predictions and you get one of them wrong, your book all of a sudden is not worth anything because how many others are wrong? If you just get one wrong, then the readers have think, well, if that one's wrong, how many others could be wrong? When you start making predictions, listen to this. There are more than a thousand predictions or prophecies in the scriptures. More than a thousand. 300 of them just about Jesus. 300 just about Jesus. And these are not like general stuff like, well, he'd be nice and kind. Not like that. You could get that right probably 50% of the time. But they were specific things. Prophecies that were specific. He would ride on a donkey into Jerusalem. He would be born in Bethlehem. He would grow up in Nazareth. He would escape Egypt. Specific things about places and what he would do. That's very specific. That's just not, well, he was a very friendly guy. These prophecies were also not just in a generation before Jesus. Like, okay, I can see this is going to happen. Let me speak a little bit about it. The last prophecy in the Bible about Jesus was 400 years before he lived. 400 years. That's like going 400 years back in our history to whoever was here in South Africa 400 years ago and say, uh, tell me what we're doing today. That's like that. Think about that. That's what that is. 400 years. I mean, listen to this one. King David prophesied about the crucifixion before there were crucifixions. They didn't even crucify people then. They didn't punish people that way. Yet he prophesied about the crucifixion even before that. And listen to this. Every single prophecy in the Bible has come absolutely true. Every one. Now, there are some still to come to pass in the book of Revelations. And I would just suggest to you, seeing as God has done such a good job up to now, you don't want to be on the wrong side of those. You don't want to be on the wrong side of those. Good time for us to get our lives in order, right? Because they've all come to pass. Well, let me give you a deeper perspective of these 300 prophecies. Because it sounds wonderful, okay, 300 prophecies. But let me just explain to you how rare it really is to get these type of prophecies right and what it means. There is a man by the name of Peter Stoner. Peter Stoner. And Peter Stoner studies probability. Probability. What is the, prob what is the probability of something happening? And himself, with a hundred other people who also study prob probability, did research for years, not just weeks or months, for years, on the probability of these prophecies of Jesus coming to pass, how true they would be. And this is what they concluded. This is what they concluded. Very clever people, okay? They said for one person, just fulfilling eight of the 300, not all 300, just fulfilling eight, is the likelihood of 1 to the 10 to the 17th power. That number on the screen. 1 to the 10 to the 17th power. That's what they said. One person fulfilling just eight of them is that number. Now, you know what probability is, right? Probability is this. If I had a bucket here and I had 10 tennis balls in them, 10. One was red and the other nine were yellow. And I blindfolded you. And you put your hand in the bucket, blindfolded, and you pulled out the red one. You had a one in 10 chance of getting that one. That's probability, one in 10. Okay? That's what it is if you were blindfolded. Now, this number over here is a big number. That's a big number. Would you agree with me? One person fulfilling eight is that number right there. Now, let me explain it to you. If I took these, can you see this? It's a five rank coin. It's a five rank coin. If I took that amount of five rank coins, that amount on the screen of five rank coins, and I had to store them somewhere, if I had to store them, do you think I could fit them in this building? If I had to store them somewhere. If I took that amount of five rank coins and I had to store them somewhere in South Africa, I had to put them somewhere. 
If I cut off just two of the provinces, the Northern and Western Cape, if I just cut those two off, these five ring coins, that number, would fill the rest of our country two feet deep. Two feet deep of these. That's how many that number is. Then if I took you and I hired a helicopter and I blindfolded you and we could fly over those provinces where all these coins were stored and at any moment you could say to me, stop, anywhere you chose, you could say stop and we lowered you down and you shoved your hand into those coins and you found the only one out of all of those that was different. There's only one out of all of those different. You shoved your hand. What chance do you think they have of that happening? It's like zero, right? But that, what I've just explained to you, is how eight of these prophecies, that's like getting eight of them right. Eight of them right, okay? So that's just for those eight. If one person fulfilled 16, that is one to the 10 to the 45th power. If one person fulfilled 48 of them, that's one to the 10 to the 157th power. Yet Jesus fulfilled all 300. Family, there's no explanation for that except man didn't write the Bible. God did. God did. And you can go check this stuff out. You can go check these studies out. There is no chance that the Bible is man-made. Zero chance. It's not possible. 2 Peter 1.21 says this, For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though men, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Family, you understand your Bible is true. If you just have a revelation of what you have by having the word of God, there's nothing to be ashamed of about having the word of God. This Bible is absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. In Matthew 26, 56, it says this. But this is all happening. Jesus speaking. This is all happening to fulfill the words of the prophet as recorded in the scriptures. They are all fulfilled and will all be fulfilled. That is one thing that is for sure. If you went to the very last book of the Bible, Revelation, and you went to the last page, Revelation 22, verse 6, if you went there, this is what it says. The last page of your Bible. It says, the angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspired the prophets, sent his angel to show his servant the things that must soon take place. Family, I'm saying to you that there's still things to come according to revelations. God has been brilliant up to now getting them all right. There is zero chance that those are going to be wrong. Zero chance. We need to make sure that our lives are right and we're serving God. Amen? We're serving God. Well, let's move on to number four. The fourth reason, the fourth thing that can prove that the Bible can be trusted is that the Bible is thematically united. If thematically, it's the same theme. Pastor Jenny taught on that last week. She did a great job. Really enjoyed that teaching last week. And so I'm not going to spend too much time on this because we covered it a bit last week. But the Holy Bible, as we said, was written over a period of 1,600 years in over a dozen countries on three different continents by 40 people in three different languages. So it was written over that period by that amount of people. How did they get the exact same story? I mean, some of us can't even tell a story right from last week. <laughs> uh, what did they say? Oh, I can't remember. You know, <clears throat> you've heard of the broken telephone story. And that happens in our lives. This was written over 1,600 years. Different continents, different people, different languages, yet the same theme. You know, the Quran was written by one person, Muhammad, right? The Quran, one person. The writings of Buddha, one person. The Analects of Confucius, one person. You would expect them to be united and, and, and have the same theme. It's written by one person. But the Bible, with that many people, over that many years, 
That's why Jesus said in Luke 24, 27, and the beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. The Bible points to one person and his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. That for me is just amazing to think that a book that can be written over that period by so many different people who didn't even know each other at all, yet the theme is the same throughout the Bible. It can only be God. And then number five, the Holy Bible is trusted by Jesus. Now there might be some that might consider this to be the weakest argument that I give you tonight. There might be some to say, well, okay, I don't know, you know, that's, that's wonderful, but it's the weakest I would think of them. But I want to say this to you, if you've given your life to Jesus, and uh, he trusted, and you trust him as your Lord and Savior, you call him your Lord and Savior, if you've given your heart to him, and he's your Lord and Savior, then I believe we have to agree that whatever he says is right, is right. You've given your life to him. You've said he's my Lord and Savior. That is what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to totally believe in what he says and to believe in what he believes. And he believes that the scriptures are right and true. In Matthew 15, 18, Jesus said this. He said, for truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law, from the word, until everything is accomplished. It's not going to change, family. That's why I challenge all those out there, all of them out there, who are deconstructing the Bible, picking and choosing what scriptures they want to follow and which ones they don't. I want to say to you, that's a dangerous thing to do. You either believe it all or you don't believe any of it. You see, family, if you believe what you like in the Bible, but don't believe what you don't like, it's not the Bible that you trust, but yourself. If you believe what you like in the Bible, but don't believe what you don't like, it's not the Bible you trust, but yourself. This is an all-in book. It's all in. It's all or nothing. Every word is true. The sixth one is the Holy Bible has survived all attacks, all attacks, which begs the question, why was it attacked in the first place? If it was just a book, why would people attack it? How many of them are attacking your Archie comics? Uh, maybe some of you don't even know what Archie comics are. <laughs> okay. Well, they're not attacking anything like that. It has to tell you why was it attacked in the first place? The Bible is the most despised, derided, denied, disputed, dissected, debated, outlawed, and destroyed book ever. Yet it endures. It is still here thousands of years later. Even some of the most brilliant minds of the day had something to say negatively about the Bible. There's a man called Voltaire. Voltaire was in France and Voltaire was known to be a, a, a brilliant mind. And he said this, he said, within 100 years, the Bible will be forgotten. That's what he said. In 100 years, the Bible will be forgotten. But the only thing that's been forgotten is that quote. <laughs> is that quote. You know what's really funny? The Lord has an amazing sense of humor. The house that he lived in, where he wrote that quote, when he died, it was bought by the French Bible Society, and today it is the French Bible Society in that house. Isn't that amazing? That's our God. <clears throat> Why is that, church? 1 Peter 1, 24 says, The grass withers and flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever and ever and ever. When we in heaven one day, we'll be discussing the word. Amen. So here are some questions we all need to ask ourselves. The first one is this. Will I attack God's word or live by it? Will I attack God's word or live by it? You see, I have to evaluate myself and say, if there is something that needs to change in me, then I'm gonna change me 
and not change the word to suit me. I'm going to change me, not the word. My second question is, will I deconstruct it or defend it? Too many people like to debate the word for their benefit. God just wants us to obey it. Just obey it. That's what he asks us to do. And my third question is, will I follow the world or the word? Which one will I follow? The world or the word? And so this brings me to the last point. And the last one, it's another interesting one because this is one that you can test yourself. This is one that you have an opportunity to test yourself. I'm sure you've often heard us say these words. We at least say it to you every year. We say these words, give us one year of your life. When we ask you to join Bible school, we say, give us one more year of your life and see what God will do. Just one year. By sitting under the word, reading the word, studying the word. I'm taking it further and say, just give us one year of your life and be in church every weekend and sit under the word of God. Just one year, every weekend and see what the word of God will do. You see, family, some people are making decisions in life about what God is able to do for them on a half-hearted effort. They hardly even know the word and they're making decisions on what God can do for them. And so here's my seventh one for you. The Holy Bible has life-changing power. It has life-changing power. Now, don't take it from me. Ask somebody who's in this church whose life has been turned around because you might say, well, you're a pastor. You're supposed to say that. You're paid to say that. Well, I'm saying don't ask me. Go ask people who will tell you their stories, where I was before Jesus and what His Word has done for me. I know what it's done for me, but ask many others. Ask people that have committed a year of their life to just sitting under the Word and how their lives have changed. I know many of you. You've told me your story, but you can test this one yourself by just sitting under the Word and seeing what it'll do for you. You see, John 8, 31 says this. Jesus says, If you hold on to my teachings, just hold on to them. If you'll just hold on to them, don't let them go. If you'll hold on to them, you are really my disciple. But this is what it says. If you hold on to it and you will study it and you will read it, then you will know the truth and you will walk in freedom. You will walk in victory. The truth will set you free by holding on, by studying. We all need freedom in some area. Whatever it is, it's not a negative thing. There's certain things we have to overcome sometimes, things we can be better at, some things that perhaps holding us back from achieving what God wants us to. Just hold on to His Word. Sit under it, weekend after weekend. When Bible school opens up for registration and you've never done it, commit one year of your life and your life will change. If you're not in a group where they study the Word, get into a group, study the Word. It has life-changing power. So I'm asking you tonight to hold on to the word and watch it transform your life. Now I'm going to ask you, I'd like you to pray a prayer with me. But before we pray the prayer, I want to read this prayer to you because maybe you don't want to pray it. So I'm going to read it to you first. It's going to come up on the screens. And if you want to pray it, then we're going to pray it together. So if you can put it up on the screens, this is it. Let me read it first. And then we can pray it together if you want to do this. It says, Dear God, from this day forward, I accept the Bible as your flawless word to me. And I will make it the final authority for my life. Even when I don't understand it, when it's not popular, easy, or even when I don't like it. You are God and I am not. Thank you for loving me enough to speak to me through your word. I want to love your word, learn your word, and live your word. If you're willing to pray that prayer, not forcing you, if you're willing to pray that prayer, let's pray it together as we read off the screens. Are you ready? If you want to pray, let's pray it out aloud together. Let's go. One, two, three. Dear God, from this day forward, I will accept the Bible as your flawless word to me, and I will make it the final authority for my life. Even when I don't understand it, when it's not popular, easy, or even when I don't like it. You are God and I am not. Thank you for, your loving, for loving me enough to speak to me through your word. I want to love your word, learn your word, 
and live your word in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you for watching the Christian Family Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join our online community and join us live every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream and share this with your friends. Thank you again for watching and God bless you.